Hey everybody, welcome back to the Cronius Focus Podcast. This will be the first pure Q&A video that I've produced. Um, I've been getting a lot more traffic. Thank you guys for helping me reach a thousand subscribers. That's awesome. Um, was never my goal when I started this, but it's great to have all these ideas being listened to and conversed with so many and by so many, right? So uh, you guys have asked a lot of questions. The questions have gotten extremely hard. So I'm going to uh, attempt to answer all of them that I've received to this point um, in this video. All right, so let's get started. So the first question I get um, or have gotten is some variant of one of the three. Why did I start this channel? What is your goal for the channel? And how can I help? Right. And so uh, I'll start by answering the first one. I started this channel uh, primarily um, so I could learn more. I always felt something was off and could never really fully articulate what exactly was off. And one of my colleagues at work, um, we used to go to lunch all the time. He's actually the one that comes on the podcast and does the talks videos with me. Um, would all, I would always, you know, talk about these concepts over lunch with a bunch of my colleagues. And he recommended, you know, putting this together, just getting the ideas out there. And um, I liked that idea. And I figured that doing so might help others to see what I see. So that's why I started the channel. Um, my ultimate goal for it is for it to remain pure like it is right now. Like I, I will never monetize the channel. I do not plan on um, making this effort into something that uh, benefits me personally in any direct way. Um, I, I have a couple Patreon subscribers right now, but you know I don't need the money. So what I'm doing, uh, which kind of branches into the how can I help question, is any money that they send, I'm just buying Google ad, uh, YouTube, uh, you know, promotional spreading the videos right around. Um, and that's really the way you can help is just spread the ideas. I like spread the ideas or challenge the ideas. One of the two. Um, again, it's, and that's really not so that the channel specifically grows or that I get any benefit out of it. I don't really want anything out of this except for these ideas to be considered known and, um, if everyone agrees, then we can avoid some of the problems that are laid out in them. So yep, that's the answer to those questions. The next question comes from uh, a user by the name BG on video two, male modes of being. And it's a long one, but the first part of it goes something like this. Somebody else wrote down very similar thoughts to mine regarding will to power and the tendency towards irrational self-propagation. And it feels too that men are rightfully feeling dissuaded by a lack of a virgin, in quotations, so to speak, at the end of their trials, thereby forfeiting most efforts beyond the bare minimum to necessitate their survival as a personal single unit. Though, while there are many men who can seek to game the system we live under, there are a few who feel pallid in the face of such unusual social circumstances such as modern-day intersexual relations. Whether this is the genetic monogamous side of humanity continually irking us with grief and confusion over the failure of usual reproduction tactics, or the already present variation in men that gives birth to such stingy prudes, there has been a growing effort to fill in these vacant virgin icons with replacements. For instance, the simp phenomenon of men shelling out cash and time for women deemed pure in their eyes. A fully constructed and artificial creation made out of the urges by lonely men for female attention in ways casual sex cannot touch. It also seems as if some men, though certainly not all, are struck with whiplash when faced with relationships with women, unable to articulate or profess their disappointment regarding what they've been told about women and what they experience, and the uncomfortable cognitive dissonance that follows. But most interestingly is a subsect of men who appear to forfeit the idea of a human woman entirely, opting to replace them with robotics, AI, and technology, 3D waifus, virtual streamers, and emotional AI. 
if someone had to force me to give my perspective on this, though admittedly the social pressures of women have the most impact on men, we have likewise created men who wish to continue this cycle of competition, of rigorous social and civilizational engineering to ensure our women don't become, for lack of a better term, female chimpanzees in their sexual tendencies, which has appeared now. The, the combat of evolution has arrived at the conclusion that the men who are not only okay with this method of sexual reproduction, but promoters of environments that further its existence, are more fit for continued existence than men who don't, through the variety of pressures that whittle them away. Even stripping us down to our most basic selfishness, we desire things that a society like Victorian England is better able to produce than the Weimar Republic. All right, my answer to this is, is a couple parts. To your first part um, about men and, and the simp phenomenon and, and all that's going on there, men do project their anima onto women continually. I like to think of this action as men making offerings at the altar of the anima in, in the hopes that it will bestow blessings to them in the form of reproductive access. Um, some women have found a way to hijack this innate urge for their own short-term benefit. Um, that's part of it, right? And that kind of sums up the simp thing. It, it's going to happen when, when the old societal contract of marriage breaks down because men are, are really compelled deep in their souls to, to worship at the altar of the feminine. And so when given a false outlet like OnlyFans or something like that, they're, they're going to take it. A, a portion of them are going to take it. To the second part uh, about men opting out altogether from interactions with women with, you know, 3D waifus, virtual streamers and emotional AI, right? Like, um, yes, I, I don't know what else to say, but yes, that's happening. Uh, see products like Gatebox. Uh, that has to be one of the most depressing advertisements I've ever watched. Um, and if you haven't watched it, I would just go into YouTube and type Gatebox and look at the three ads that are out there in Japan and Man, that's not a world I want to live in where that's normal. So um, it seems empty. Um, to your last point, right? Uh, you, you make the case that somehow the male hierarchy is is going to select for and change the female hierarchy. And this is an interesting perspective, right? My general view is that the male hierarchy's manipulation of the female hierarchy is, is crude and rudimentary at best. I could be wrong, uh, but it's just... It's just been such a short time in evolutionary time frames that the female hierarchy has even existed. We cannot expect the male hierarchy, hierarchy as a group um, to have evolved uh, very sophisticated evaluation techniques for females. And that's really why you see things like mammary gland size and hairstyles being so prominent in the female hierarchical competition. It's a result of the fact that males simply have not developed sophisticated analytical techniques to judge the female hierarchy in any major way. Yet, and, and again, we're entering into an evolutionary filter to the last part of your, your, your question right now where many women are actually self-selecting out of the gene pool. So I'll, I'll say that it is possible that the males as a group could have influence during this filtration by selecting for more complicated traits like you're talking about. Um, but I've seen very little evidence that the top of the male hierarchy is interested in doing that at all. It seems satisfied with sterile sex and the continuation of the crude analysis of the female hierarchy. So uh, I, I just don't think it's going to come from there. I, I think I think that the the return to morality is going to come rather than pressure from one hierarchy to the other from internal um, restructuring of the hierarchy from the constituent elements within so females fixing females males fixing males so to speak and really it's really people fixing themselves um i could be wrong but that's that's how i see it all right the next question comes from da and which is a comment on video one I don't think the objective of evolution is true perception, because an organism that perceives everything in accordance to survival and reproduction instincts reproduces much more than one that is more concerned to find the truth about the universe. This is probably why most religions consider the material world an evil place, and why we have to tame the senses to perceive things as they truly are. I also think you may be implying that evolution is always a process that moves toward progress and complexity, and this is also highly debatable. So there's been a couple questions around this as well. I think in the first video, I um, probably didn't explain better, but I'm using true perception defined as action of said perception being a positive outcome 
fitness function wise. So it's basically Nietzsche's definition of truth or redefinition of, of the importance of an opinion. As far as evolution moving towards complexity, it is debatable if those paths are in the end the ultimate paths towards maximum fitness, but it's not debatable that evolution is testing those paths actively because we exist, as does all multicellular life and, and very complicated life out there. Um, this kind of question branches into topics that I plan on covering in the Fermi Paradox video, so, and, so I'm going to save those for there. All right, the next question is from TE, uh, and it's a comment on vid4. In the previous episode, you explained how by evolving monogamy, we decrease competition and increase cooperation. But the monogamy shown there, each male has an equal chance of getting a female of equal value, seems less way suppressive as a reproductive system than, for example, the wolves and scorpions shown in the graph here, where there's still a tendency for females to select the top males. And this is spot on. That's actually a good, a good approach. But what I mean by less suppressive is... Um, is not focused on the masculine perspective. So you're thinking it from a mac masculine perspective. Most species suppress male reproduction via the male uh, hierarchy, which is, you know, the female when it's present also can play, but there's very little of that. Um, the difference in cooperative species is the suppression of the female. That's, that's the sole difference, right? The greater degree of female reproductive suppression, the greater degree of cooperation amongst individuals. And that's a general rule, right? And it is really... It really is all about forcing uh, an inclusive fitness focus. So that's the, the point I'm trying to make. The next question I've gotten from a multiple people uh, saying something to the effect of that it sounds like my ideas follow along closely with what Peterson says, Jordan Peterson. Uh, are there any areas that I would disagree with him? Um, and the answer is yes to both. Um, I, I, you know, I did, I am pretty heavily influenced with his derivation of the male hierarchy from Jung and Nietzsche and you know he laid it out pretty descriptively his biblical series if you haven't watched it it's definitely worth the watch he goes through um, the Old Testament or at least the first part of the Old Testament uh, decently uh, into depth and the ideas that he puts forward there are for the most part uh, really good um, to the second part what areas do I disagree with Peterson there's a few um, although they don't constitute what I would call the core of his work um, one of the things is he doesn't really address the origins of the female hierarchy at all, nor does he focus on how important that is uh, for balance it, it, that we have in society, right? And I kind of lay that out in the third and fourth video that it's really, um, the, you know, the female hierarchy is really a result of societally enforced monogamy, which does which he does talk about a little bit, but the merry aspects of it, he doesn't really get into. So uh, I think that that's important to note, and that really drives into the next point, is that his openness to pharmaceutical fixes for mental conditions, I think, is too high. Uh, while there are some specific conditions that need medication, the mass ingestion of like SSRIs, lithium, benzodiazepines um, by the population, I don't think is well advised. I, um, I think it's about the same as the mass ingestion of hormonal contraceptives. <laughs> What's funny is, I, and it's not really funny, it's tragic, but I think Peterson would probably agree with this position now, given what's happened to him. Um, I, I think that uh, we, we play with fire when we start messing uh, on a grand scale with a lot of people's cognitive functioning. The next question has a couple variants of it, but I'm going to summarize it in, in one. It's, it's related to video four. Um, and it's something like this. You talk a lot about the left versus right and put them on equal footing in the video. You don't mention how viable it is to really force greater eusociality from a left's perspective. And, uh, you know, that's a fair assessment. I In that video, I attempted to play devil's advocate and give um, both sides their, I would say, Iron Man arguments, right? My personal perspective is that it is not viable to do that. We don't know enough to be doing what we're doing. I do not know, right? Um, and I do think that the evidence, though, points to people living less meaningful and fulfilling lives in our current attempt at it, in spite of our increased wealth and lifespan. And that given the uh, fertility rates, it's probably not sustainable. The next question comes from some guy with a very interesting name that I don't know how to pronounce that. It looks like it's two little animals from vid one. 
And he says, uh, I see logo says this. If you study anything, you will be inspired and disgusted by it later. Making art and making money on art. Engineering to solve problems and engineering obsolescence. Personal spirituality and question mark. I am here. This seems like a flat ground approach. So then the idea of as above, so below comes into play. If it's as bad as it is here, how bad is it down there and up there? And more importantly, which one is worse? So my answer to this question is going to kind of touch on a part of a broader answer to a more broad question about like how we attack uh, what we see as a, a failing or crumbling society. But what I want to say is it's important to remember that faith is an inherent requirement for acting on a non-exact solution. We as neural networks generate nothing but approximate solutions based on a set of underlying assumptions. Faith in those assumptions is a prerequisite to action based on that analysis. Given this, you must have faith that more accurate descriptions of truth when acted upon, which means spoken or shared or actual action, will improve the current state of society and move us closer to the kingdom of God. Spirituality was never meant to be solely personal. Its role is in properly balancing the needs of the individual with the needs of the group. Voluntary sacrifice by the individual of their own selfish ambition and the elevation of the societal needs above your own is the correct perspective. It's important to note that the inverse of this, the forced sacrifice of the individual by the society for its own betterment is evil and leads to nothing but hell. The next one is basically, um, it's from, I've gotten a question quite a bit, and it's basically a comment that I'm focusing too much on the nuclear family and only women leaving the home most recently, right? What about men leaving the home? What about the loss of the extended family and the small community? And these are all really valid points. Uh, I do not want to make it seem as though a single nuclear family is the ideal um, for our previous lifestyle and to get back some of the traditions and more cohesion. Um, it just happens to be the last vestige. It's, it's the last thing that's hanging on for life right now. And I, I'm, it also is the core of the others, right? The two parent home is very, very, very important. Um, having grandparents is also important. Having extended family around is also important. But really right now we're at the place where we're about to lose the last thing. And uh, so I'm trying to defend that. But to your points, all of it matters. All right, the next question I've gotten a number of different ways. It's how can you be sure that hormonal contraceptive is the primary cause of all these issues you lay out? What about the death of religion, the rise of social media, um, the feminist movement impact, the industrial revolution, et cetera, et cetera? Uh, the answer is that I cannot. Uh, I just look like when I was trying to figure out what possibly could motivate all of the like we've had a lot of major shifts in the last less than 100 years right really 50 ish years right 60 something like that and i was trying to, to to figure out one fundamental shift that we had during that time frame that could help to explain some of this and the one thing that, that kept circling back was the idea of voluntary sterilization and that concept just, it's such, uh, it's something that you don't find in the animal kingdom. It's so rare for, for, for any individual with any species to voluntarily forego reproduction. It just, like, it, it doesn't make for a stable system. Yet here we had, you know, a huge swath of the most developed part of our species, the Western world plus East Asia, that was voluntarily like sterilizing themselves with these hormones. And at the same time that that, that that ability to forego reproduction was invented in the very beginning, all these shifts started to happen. And while their roots, you know, may exist in the first wave feminist movements, you know, the suffragettes, etc., and some of the Marxist doctrine that, that laid the groundwork before that, I just, you know, you, you look at everything and, and, Obviously, the Industrial Revolution plays into that. The death of religion plays into that. The Enlightenment mindset in plays into this, right? But some of the things that have happened from the 60s onward, like, 
The mass ingestion of mind-altering hormones by the fertile female population of our species is a major driver. It has to be. And I, again, I go back to other eusocial species. All of the other eusocial species use hormones and pheromones and things like that to suppress reproduction in subordinate females, and it changes how they behave. It, I mean, greatly changes how they behave. Why would we think that we're any different? And even if it's not the number one cause, it's still definitely a contributing factor. So there's even allies about this issue in the feminist camps that we can, they, you know, there, there are articles out there about how hormonal contraceptive makes them feel bad and they don't like the side effects and that it's not a good thing, that they're not crazy for thinking that it's bad, right? And I just think this is one of the issues that there's enough evidence behind, objective evidence that we can say, hey, look, Look at this thing. This is not good. We can all agree it's not good. Let's not let's stop encouraging 14-year-old girls to fundamentally alter their entire worldview with hormones from a, from that age on. Like if we can just agree to that, we can get rid of a lot like whatever impact it has, we can take that impact out. And so that's what I want to focus on. All right. Uh, the next question I get have gotten quite a bit is my answer for how to fix the problems that we have in society is incomplete, right? Or it's not, it doesn't really answer the full question. So, and they come in usually three variants. The first is like, clean up your room. Really? Haven't we already heard this before? It was kind of a joke, a meme. Peterson put it out there a while ago. The second is like, hey, you know, fine, your life gets better, but it doesn't really change anything. You still, you know, how do you make society, all these trends that are happening, how does that help you fight those trends? And then the third is that society is too far gone, uh, better to just let it die. Uh, nothing you can do at this point is going to help, right? And no amount of self-integration or individuation or improvement is going to fix anything. And all right, so I'm going to address these in order. To the first point, clean up your room, really. Uh, look, that's a fair, that's a fair criticism. I, I, don't, I think cleaning up your room as the first step is, is not, it's not the right first step. The first step, the first, I mean, everyone's in a different state, but the first step has to be cleaning your body. If your body is not in proper shape, if, if you're not taking care of your physical vehicle correctly, everything that you try to motivate yourself to do is going to be harder than it should be. So start with your body and clean your body. And then the second step is to clean your mind. And as an extension of your mind is how you operate, right? And that's where the room and everything else comes into play and set up the environments to exist in. And then, you know, once you've sorted that out, then, then you can move on to trying to help other people sort out their stuff. But you really have to master all those internal demons. You know, you're driven by a lot of forces. And so I think the first one, the one that, that a lot of Americans struggle with a lot that, you know, Peterson even mentioned, I'm not sure why he didn't make this his first, is, is hunger and, and really the appetite and gluttony. It's, it's a major, you know, that and sexual lust are the two main, uh, you know, vices of modern America and mo modern West. And so of the two, I think that fixing diet is the most important. Because if you do that, if you fix the gluttony aspect and the obesity aspect and you get your body working correctly, you'll have plenty of energy to try to accomplish the other stuff. And then you're not constantly expending willpower to maintain um, domination over your, 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 your food processing systems right? that we all seem to struggle with. Proper diet will help with that. All right. So... That's kind of the first thing. Yeah, cleaning up your room is part of the process. Again, it's an oversimplification, but you really need to go through the process of individuation and put all those subsystems under your control. Get them into check. Quit letting them run your life. And I think that starts with the ones most important to the body, and that's going to be diet and exercise. All right. So second question. Fine, your life gets better, but it doesn't change anything. It's like, yeah, well, that's not true. And so I'm going to speak from some, some personal experience here. Because I went through this process with my own life over the last, let's say, three years. And one of the striking, the most striking things, other than, than how effortless 
the the advancement became towards the end is that just by talking about what I was doing with friends and family, I noticed I noticed a shift in all of them. And that's what the strangest thing for me was, which really cemented this nodal view for me is that, you know, I didn't really push on anybody. I didn't make anybody do anything. I just shared what I was doing. And by the results I was having, people noticed the change in my demeanor, my personality. They thought I was more stable. I had more control over my, the way I was speaking, my, all of my relationships with my my family and my friends and my my in-laws all improved like everything just seemed to get better and more than just from my perspective i noticed that they started to tackle some of the difficult problems they had in their life as well it's almost as though and I don't want to. I don't want to presume that they were inspired. That's not. That's not what I'm trying to say. It's that. That by, again, it goes back to what's written in Matthew. Is that first you pluck the beam out of your own eye, and I had a beam in my eye, and I plucked it out. I got. I got myself balanced. I figured out what I was seeing in the world. Why it was frustrating me. Why my communication never seemed to make anyone see my point of view. Right? That was the biggest thing that bothered me. I saw these things, but I could never convince anybody that, that what I was seeing was real. They always just they always just scoffed at my perception. And the reason is, is because the perception when embodied in the form I had by the manner in which I spoke and the manner in which I presented myself. And again, I, I was relatively successful right at that point. I was still making decent money. I had a good paying job, had a family, a wife. I, was, I wasn't a failure, but... And yet people were dismissing what I thought was obvious, logical perception of the world. And it wasn't until I really made the effort to internalize all of that, to better my own life, to live by those rules that I was seeing, that everyone started to pay attention to what I was saying and say, you know, there's something, there might be something to this. And then people start to diet better and lose some weight and they feel really good and they start to read more and they start to, to, you know, talk less radically to one another. Like it just, it had a calming effect on the entire node that I was connected to. And look, maybe, maybe I was the agitated node making everyone upset. I don't know. The point is overall, everything around me calmed down and improved. And that's one part of it. And now a part of that entire process for me is this YouTube channel and these videos where I'm trying to share what I've learned and people are receptive to it. If everybody did this, right? I don't have all the answers, neither does anyone. We all have differing perspectives that all are valid and need to be shared so that we can look at everything and say, all right, yeah, I like this from this, I like that from this. I'm gonna combine all these things together to help myself. If everybody went through the process of actually doing this and speaking very carefully and putting their ideas out there in, in the best reflected manner they could, we could get a real handle on some of these problems. But right now, so many people are unstable and they may see the problem, but they speak about it in such an unstable way that everyone just turns off and doesn't wanna listen. So your goal is to try to be the, the best representation of what your perception embodied actually results in so that people will pay attention to what you say. That's the point. And I guarantee, I guarantee you, you can think of times when you've told someone what you know to be true and they dismissed it and you can't figure out why. Well, the answer is because you're not convincing enough. You're not, and to be convincing, you have to live it. That's my point. You don't really know how to live it, so you gotta figure that out. And it's something that you never stop doing. You never stop doing. All right, and then the last part is society's too far gone, better to just let it die. And to that, I simply say no. I I'm not going there. I, I Look, I've had comments that talked about, you know, Moloch and, uh, you know, Ted Turner's 600 million comment, the Georgia Guidestones. <sighs> Like pretty much every, you know, again, and the Moloch stuff comes from a lot of the Bohemian Grove rituals, right? Like all of this stuff, I am aware of all of it, 
Like, I, I understand all of the conspiracy theories that are out there. I get it. And what those tend to do is paralyze you. They paralyze you. Because every single conspiracy theory boiled, boiled down to its constituent elements is there's this all-powerful group that has complete control over X thing. And nothing you're ever going to do is going to fix it. They control the entire government. They control all of the media, they do all the propaganda. And whether you take your pick of who it is, the Illuminati, the Jews, you can put them, uh, for, as far as the left's concerned, it's the corporations, the bourgeoisie, right? The, there's always somebody who's all powerful and all controlling. And listen, like whether or not that any of those are true is irrelevant because your proper orientation to any of that is the same thing. Fix your node and try to make the best network around you possible. Elevate everyone in your life, your family, your friends, to the highest state you can and dedicate your life to that mission. And in so doing, you will contribute to making a better society, right? If you allow yourself to think along the terms that you are impotent in the face of an all-powerful conspiracy, you're never going to act. And you can blame that conspiracy for everything in your life you fail to achieve. And that's the problem I have with it. It's not a matter of whether it's true or not. It doesn't matter. It paralyzes you to think along those lines. So stop. Have faith. Have faith and execute to make your life the best it can be. And in so doing, sacrifice your own personal goals to elevate those around you. And in doing that, you find meaning and you might just save us all. And with that, I'm gonna end this episode. All right, guys, thanks for uh, being here for another episode. Please like and subscribe. Um, and most importantly, keep sending me your challenging comments and emails. They make me expand my knowledge and they force me to learn new things. Um, and, and to be perfectly frank, everything that's in this channel is really a community effort. Uh, you guys, through your comments early on and your emails, um, forced the expansion of my understanding and helped me art to articulate ideas that I didn't fully comprehend when I started this. So I want to thank you all from the bottom of my heart for that. Um, it's really helped me. So please keep it up. Uh, again, follow me at Twitter. Email me, cronies.focus at gmail.com. And do like and subscribe. It helps the algorithms to share this uh, with other people that may be similar to you. Uh, also, share this anywhere you want. Spread the word. Uh, that's the number one goal I have. So I appreciate your time, and we'll see you next time.